Uh, hello everyone and welcome to BFW 2401 week five bank capital planning. Now in this week, we will talk about the capital planning from the private perspective, which means from the perspective of the management of the bank, not from the perspective of the regulator. And therefore we will talk about something called uh, target capital. So uh, briefly, I have divided this uh, lecture into, two, into four parts. So the first part, we will just define this capital and measure it. And when we come to the definition, we will talk, of course, about the uh, regulatory definition. Then in the second part, which is the core, actually, of this, uh, of this week, is to talk about the target capital. And in number three, we will go and see if when we know what is our target capital, which means how much capital we should have as a percentage to the total assets, we will start now looking where we can get this capital. Of course, our assets will growing and our capital should grow. Now, when, when our asset is growing and we need more capital because it's a proportional, then in this case, we, will, we want to know where to get that capital. We have two areas. Either we get it from the return earning or we call it from the internal sources. And here there is some calculations. And this is, will be part three. And number, number part four is actually talking about the external sources. As you can see, it's a story and it's a nice story. And I think we can, uh, we can do it fast. So uh, in the first part, I have uh, around 20 slides. If you allow me to share, I think I will go over it very fast. Now, just this is the, uh, uh, first issue we are talking about, and uh, you can see I, I'm, I'm bringing this um, this map again the, for the purpose of uh, telling you that uh, we are talking about the capital risk, which is capital planning. But actually, but actually, one would wonder what's the difference between capital risk and this capital which we talk here. Uh, which is the what you call the capital adequacy. This is the regulator perspective, which we will take it in week 11. It's a long walk, a big walk. And this is what we are talking about, the target capital and all these issues. So uh, just to, to show you where we are and what is the difference between this one and this one and how it fits in our learning objectives. Now, uh, let's talk about the learning objectives here. Uh, we want to define the capital. There is two approaches, as I told you. Uh, we want to know the regulatory definition and the uh, symbol ratio definition. Uh, and then uh, we will outline the bank capital planning in relation to selecting the target capital and achieving that target capital, where to get it. And we will, uh, at the end, we will have two models this is actually a measure of how we can and plan to get capital from inside uh, the bank. And we'll talk about two models, as I told you, the internal generating, uh, 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 internal uh, ICGR, which is internal generating capital ratio. And there's another model called as growth model. Now, um, this is the references, but I think the slides will be okay with the tutorial and the workshop. But if you can access this book, I think this is uh, the better place to, uh, to, to reflect what we are talking about here. Now, uh, this is the uh, capital planning part one. So as you see, we will define the capital. Now defining the capital, somebody would say, well, someone would say, we already defined it so many times. Yes, but the thing that you will know today is that there is two definition. Before we measure it, we want to define it. This is A, which is the symbol definition, which we understand the capital is just the difference between the total assets and the total liabilities, which means the difference between book value of the assets and liabilities. And we know that, and we know its components is the issued shares and any reserves and any profit we didn't uh, distribute, or we call it the return earning. This keep accumulating and increasing the capital. And this is actually when we started our IPO and we started with our shares or other you know, uh, uh, issues after that, 
this is the issued shares and then this is what comes from the profit and also the reserves that we accumulate uh, as we progress in time and operate. Now, um, what is the function of the uh, of the back capital? Now, this function is different because the function of corporate is what? Is to buy raw materials and to pay for the, what we call the establishment, the establishment expenses, um, you know, the uh, fixed assets, and operating capital, and uh, all of those is actually for the operations. Now, for us, the function of the capital is in banking is it's a long term funding, and this is not really the most important thing. Uh, but also when, when, when we have capital and enough capital, we demonstrate to the shareholders, we demonstrate the shareholders commitment. And this is why in this country, for example, they asked for 1 billion ringgit. Why? Because the shareholders who established the bank are actually paying from, the, from their pockets $1, mil, $1 billion dollar or 1 billion ringgit. And this is really a commitment. Now, um, with that, when we have enough capital, we support also the confidence to the market and ensure that management is exposed to market discipline. This is very interesting, which means now when we have less capital, the market will start punishing us by giving us more risk and decreasing our price because the price is actually related to the risk because it's the cash flow over the price of the over the risk. So when we have less capital, of course, we will be perceived to have um, 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 you know, capital risk and therefore uh, our share price will go down. And uh, you know, when they invest with us or when they deposit with us, they may ask for more returns. So this is when we say it support the confidence and the issue. So when we have enough capital, uh, uh, outsiders uh, actually are uh, confident and we are not exposed, you know, to uh, this risk of, of, uh, of market discipline, which means punishing us for not having enough capital. And then, of course, this is the main thing, which is I need the capital mainly to buffer my losses when it happens. Now, I think I have talked about this, which is actually the buffering issue. It's the same thing. You have the internal risk, which is all of those risks, which we keep talking about it. You already, uh, you know, know it. We have talked so many times about it. We have defined so many of them. This creating, this created risk is coming in this area. And in this area, of course, we will have all those management inside the, all those systems, uh, and controls and corporate governance inside the bank to prevent this risk or to decrease it, uh, like the policies of credit policy, the, the uh, policies of liquidity, the policies of trading, all of this is so many policies and all this to, to decrease the risk. But sometimes we cannot actually decrease the risk. So it will go the capital and this is the function of the capital when we say it's a, a, a buffer. When we say here, it's a buffer. This is what we mean by the buffer and I think you already know that. Now, um, uh, this is just to explain what I just said here, which means for a given system of management, uh, uh, management and control, uh, more capital means a lower probability of insolvency and safer bank. We understand that because it buffers any losses and it doesn't take us to bankruptcy. Now, this is the interesting point, which is the regulatory definition, which I think it's a new for you. What is it, regulatory definition, which is different from the from the from this definition, which is uh, the equity? Equity, we know it's just the difference between the assets and liabilities. But those guys are talking about something else. They are talking about we need a capital that have the following characteristics: one, to provide permanent and restricted commitment of funds, which means if I participate with my capital in some type of bonds, for example, I participate five percent or three percent. 4% for this long investment of 30 years. Now I can use the capital money instead of using the money of the, uh, uh, you know, the depositors because it's risky because this is the shareholders and they can be patient and uh, they don't have claims against us unless we go bankrupt. 
um, uh, be freely available to observe losses, uh, which means this is the most important thing. We need a capital that doesn't pay, <clears throat> sorry, that doesn't pay, um, is available to use it any time to buffer the losses, which means it's all the time it's there available. And actually, it doesn't pay services, which means now um, the loans, if I'm taking, if I'm financing my assets from debt, I have a service fee, I have servicing. Servicing means this interest which I pay. But here, I'm not paying for the uh, shareholders. Yes, I'm paying dividends, but when I decide to pay dividends, if I say no, that's okay. If I say a management on the board say no, dividends, or there is no profits, no, but he, here it's a fixed servicing fee. You uh, take a loan or you take a debt, then in this case, there is that part of interest. If you default, you are bankrupt. Here, if I say no dividends, no problem. And finally, um, it ranks behind the claims of depositors and other creditors in the event of winding up. So when we close the bank, when we wind it up, or we uh, liquidate the bank, we will pay all the people, all the creditors, all the depositors, whatever is left, we will distribute it among the shareholders. So if that, that capital, as you can see, it looks like equity capital. It looks like equity capital. And this is actually the essential capital. And the regulators actually focus on that capital, which seems like the equity capital. Uh, do we have any other capitals? Uh, yes, we call it tier capital. So the tier capital part of it, part of it is the equity capital, this one. But it has other parts, which is less quality. Now, the, the, uh, what we call uh, the top quality is the equity, fine, which is actually, uh, you know, um, if you take this condition, it applies to it. The second one, ordinary shares, which is the equity. The second one is the preference shares. But the preference shares, we pay dividends, actually. And when we pay dividends for them, and that dividends is fixed, so I can pay 6%. And they have to pay it. It's like a debt. Um, they don't have voting rights. We understand the preference shares, and they are different from the common shares. Um, you know, they are just, uh, uh, we pay them, we call it dividends, but it's a fixed dividends every year. Now, this type of preference shares are two types. One of them called cumulated and the other one called non-cumulated. The non-cumulated is part one of tier one. Why it is uh, part of tier one, which means higher quality, better quality than the cumulative one. Why? Because if the preference shares, for example, are supposed to pay to receive 6% annual dividends, and we didn't pay this year dividends, that 6% is not going to forward to next year. So next year, I'm not going to pay 12%. And if I don't pay next year, then I am not going to pay the third year 18%. So in this case, we are talking actually of something close to equity, close to equity. Okay, so, so and this is what it, why, may, why we make it tier one. Now, the capital, which we have, as I told you, tier one and tier two, and both of them, tier one and tier two, represent what we call the total capital. Maybe this is a new concept for you. So, the, so we have ordinary shares, and number one, non cumulative, and the third one is the retail earning. And I think most of you in accounting, retail earning is just that part of the profit that I don't distribute distribute it to the to the uh, to the shareholders. What is left after we pay the dividends? It is a return earning, and it becomes part of the capital and join that pool. Now we have also general reserves. Any reserve we take from our expenses and for income for any different uh, uh, type, we have so many reserves. Um, those reserves actually is part of tier one. And actually we have the last one, which is specially approved hybrid. Now, don't worry about this specially approved because it's approved by the regulator. We are talking about the hybrid securities. Hybrid securities, it's a debt. It's actually a debt that can be transferred to equity, which means if the bank, which is taking this debt, decided to make it equity, then it will be an equity. 
which means now they cannot actually ask me to pay that debt. I can pay it if I'm willing to, but if I'm not willing, I can transfer it to a type of equity. And this is what make it actually part of tier one. Now, somebody would say, so what about tier two? Tier two is the following. We have something called supplementary capital, which is tier two. Now you can look while I'm talking now, see whether the quality, whether when I say quality, whether it actually reflects those characteristics, which means whether I can use it, whether it's available to use it. If you look to supplementary capital, which is tier two, it's less. It's less, it has less accessibility. So we have the first one is mandatory convertible notes. Mandatory convertible note is a bond issued by a company which must be converted into shares to common stock on or before a specific date. This is actually because there is a specific date and all these issues, we make it like a mandatory, uh, it's a convert, it's, it, it becomes part of tier two. So there is a specific date, which is different from the hybrid securities. Now, the other thing it's asset re-evaluation reserves. And this is very interesting. And those people in accounting know, for example, if take any bank here, say for example, public bank. Now public bank started in 1965. In 1965, maybe they bought a big land here in Clank Valley for international student Clank Valley is the biggest part here in San Angor. Now, which includes Kuala Lumpur, of course. Uh, so that land that time, maybe it was 1 million ringgit or 1 million ringgit is too much. Now, I want to sell this land now, maybe it's huge land, maybe it's 200 to 300 million uh, ringgit, or maybe already have a billion. So in my books, it's still 1 million. If I come and, if I come and reevaluate that land or that building, which I acquired in 1965, I will have 290, for example, if I sell it for 300 million, if, if the price, I didn't sell it, I just reevaluated, and it's 299 million, the difference, with, because I sell it down for 300 million and it was in my books for 1 million, that 299 million is a reserve, a uh, reevaluation reserves. As you can see, it's not really a capital. Yes, it will be part of my capital, and I will show it in my balance sheet, it's a capital. But actually, if I want to access that capital, I have to build, sell the building, maybe of the head office. And this is different issue. And then we have some other general reserve for credit losses, like this provision for, uh, uh, for, uh, for credit risk and for losses, uh, for bad loans. So those ones, actually, we accumulate them, expecting that somebody will come in the future with default and then we have to pay but it is not actually happened yet so that type is actually part of the capital but because it's part of the capital and it is reserved for some contingent uh it's top type of contingencies that will happen in the future so in this case uh, we may use it in the future but actually it's part of our capital and regulators allow us to use it as part of tier two. So a reserve that against future um, recently unidentified losses like credit risk, whether for individuals or for group exposure, and also the best use, uh, where any amount due under contract, um, interest, rents for whatever, this is actually part of the general reserve for credit risk, which is part of uh, um, uh, tier two. And number three, our friend, which is accumulative. Now I already explained what is the accumulative, which is tier one, um, which is um, uh, in, tier, in, in tier one, um, accumulative, <clears throat> accumulative preferred shares. This one, which I don't have to pay, this one is different. It is a preference shares, but if I don't pay this year, 6%, I have to pay next year, 16. Uh, the 12, third year 18. So actually it becomes like a debt. It is, we call it preference shares, but actually it becomes like a debt because it just 
you know, forwarded those commitments, which means there is a commitment for it. And finally, we have subordinated debt. Now, subordinated debt is any type of loan that is paid after all other corporate debts and loans. So if we participated with any company as capital, and then um, uh, that, that, that our participation or investment from capital and the other companies is actually will be paid for us after all, you know, debitors are paid. So actually we are like the people who are receiving the residual value. That actually is still capital, but still under this coordinated debt. So having said that, this is the actually the tier one and tier two and the definition of the capital, definition of the regulatory capital and definition of the same ratio. And maybe this is one of the new things that uh, you may know in this time. So uh, yeah, to conclude now, uh, uh, tier one capital is the focus of capital planning. And we want this capital to be always there. And actually it looks like equity capital as I explained it to you. Um, regulators even very suspicious and not really very suspicious are not very, you know, uh, uh, their concentration also not uh, with the uh, tier one capital, but also, uh, but with tier one and the uh, equity capital. Okay, this is a summary. You want to use it, fine. You don't want to use it, fine, but it will give you the picture. So we talk about the equity capital, we talk about the regulatory definition, we talk about the risk, we talk about tier one, we talk about tier two, <laughs> and we talk about all those risks. So all of these issues actually has explained, this is just uh, you know a summary of those slides I have talked about. Let's go now to the majoring of the capital, and this is just a piece of cake. So we have four majors. Uh, we have getting ratio, um, leverage multiplier. I think you already know this from week four. Uh, and we have the symbol capital ratio, which we know it, everybody know it, even in accounting, it's pretty capital over total assets. And we have this the regulatory definition, which is tier one plus tier two over the total weighted. So um, if you have this balance sheet and you want to calculate the uh, the capital according to the score ratios, you can calculate all of them, except for this one, because I don't know what is the risk weighted assets. There is nothing here about the risk weighted assets. So um, I will calculate the giving ratio to be 90 over 13 times, uh, this one to be 14 times, this one to be 7%, and this one I don't know because I don't know the... So as you can see, when the capital is, and the, uh, as the denominator, um, an increase in, the, in this, uh, in one and two implies increased capital risk, which means if this is less, and this is becoming 14 times, 15 times, 16 times, which means my capital is getting smaller and smaller and smaller comparing to the, uh, uh, comparing to the total asset. Here, the gearing ratio over uh, the liabilities. When it becomes smaller, smaller to the liability, it's also, um, increase uh, and target capital. But when we, when my capital is actually the, uh, the uh, nominator uh, and it increases, this percentage I like it to increase. So that is actually uh, decreasing capital risk. When it increases here and here, it decreases capital risk simply because our capital is increasing. Here, our capital is decreasing. It's as simple as this. I'm done for this part. Thank you very much. I will not waste your time and I will stop this and I will see you on the second, uh, uh, second part. Thank you. Bye-bye.